This is a recording of Cry, the Beloved Country by Alan Patton. Book 2, Chapter 18 There is a lovely road that runs from Asopo into the hills. These hills are grass-covered and rolling, and they are lovely beyond any singing of it. The road climbs seven miles into them to Carisbrook, and from there, if there is no mist, you look down on one of the fairest valleys of Africa. About you there is grass and bracken, and the forlorn crying of the Titihoya, one of the birds of the veld. Below you is the valley of the Umzikulu, on its journey from the Drakensberg to the sea, and beyond and behind the river, great hill after great hill, and beyond and behind them, the mountains of Ingeli and East Griqualand. The grass is rich and matted. You cannot see the soil. It holds the rain and the mist, and they seep into the ground, feeding the streams in every kloof. It is well tended, and not too many cattle feed upon it, and not too many fires burn it, laying bare the soil. Up here on the tops is a small and lovely valley, between two hills that shelter it. There is a house there, and flat, plowed fields. They will tell you that it is one of the finest farms of this countryside. It is called High Place, the farm and dwelling place of James Jarvis, Esquire, and it stands high above Nodacheni and the great valley of the Umzimkulu. Jarvis watched the plowing with a gloomy eye. That hot afternoon sun of October poured down on the fields, and there was no cloud in the sky. Rain, rain, there was no rain. The clods turned up hard and unbroken, and here and there the plow would ride uselessly over the iron soil. At the end of the field it stopped, and the oxen stood sweating and blowing in the heat. It is no use. Um numzana. Keep at it, Thomas. I shall go up to the tops and see what there is to see. You will see nothing, um numzana. I know because I have looked already. Jarvis grunted, and calling his dog, set out along the kaffir path that led up to the tops. There was no sign of drought there, for the grass was fed by the mist, and the breeze blew coolingly on his sweating face. But below the tops the grass was dry, and the hills of Nodacheni were red and bare, and the farmers on the tops had begun to fear that the desolation of them would eat back, year by year, mile by mile, until they too were overtaken. Indeed, they talked about it often, for when they visited one another and sat on the long, cool verandas drinking their tea, they must needs look out over the barren valleys and the bare hills that were stretched below them. Some of their labor was drawn from Nodacheni, and they knew how year by year these was less food grown in these reserves. There were too many cattle there, and the fields were eroded and barren. Each new field extended the devastation. Something might have been done if these people had only learned how to fight erosion, if they had built walls to save the soil from washing if they had plowed along the contours of the hills. But the hills were steep, and indeed some of them were never meant for plowing, and the oxen were weak, so that it was easier to plow downwards, and the people were ignorant and knew nothing about farming methods. Indeed, it was a problem almost beyond solution. Some people said there must be more education, but a boy with education did not want to work on the farms, and went off to the towns to look for more congenial occupation. The work was done by old men and women, and when the grown men came back from the mines in the towns, they sat in the sun and drank their liquor and made endless conversation. Some said there was too little land anyway, and that the natives could not support themselves on it, even with the most progressive methods of agriculture. But there were many sides to such a question. For if they got more land and treated it as they treated what they had already, the country would turn into a desert. And where was the land to come from, and who would pay for it? And indeed, there was still another argument. For if they got more land, and if by some chance they could make a living from it, 
who would work on the white men's farms? There was a system whereby a native could live at Nodacheni and go to work at his will on the adjoining farms. And there was another system whereby a native could get land from the farmer and set up his crawl and have his family there and be given his own piece of land and work it, providing that he and his family gave so much labor each year to the white farmer. But even that was not perfect, for some of them had sons and daughters that left for the towns and never came back to fulfill their portion of the contract, and some of them abused the land that they had, and some of them stole cattle and sheep for meat, and some of them were idle and worthless till one had to clear them off the farm and not to be certain if their successors would be any better. Jarvis turned these old thoughts over in his mind as he climbed to the tops, and when he reached them he sat down on a stone and took off his hat, letting the breeze cool him. This was a view that a man could look at without tiring of it, this great valley of the Omzukulu. He looked could look around on the green, rich hills that he had inherited from his father, and down on the rich valley where he lived and farmed. It had been his wish that his son, the only son that had been born to them, would have taken it after him. But the young man had entertained other ideas and had gone in for engineering. And, well, good luck to him. He had married a fine girl and had presented his parents with a pair of fine grandchildren. It had been a heavy blow when he decided against High Place, but his life was his own, and no other man had a right to put his hands on it. Down in the valley below, there was a car going up to the house. He recognized it as the police car from Isopo, and it would probably be Benedic on his patrol, and a decent fellow for an Afrikaner. Indeed, Isopo was full of Afrikaners now, whereas once there had been none of them for all the police were Afrikaners, and the post office clerks, and the men at the railway station, and the village people got on well with them one way and the other. Indeed, many of them had married English-speaking girls, and that was happening all over the country. His own father had sworn that he would disinherit any child of his who married an Afrikaner, but times had changed. The war had put things back a bit, for some of the Afrikaners had joined the army and some war for the war but didn't join the army, and some were just for neutrality, and if they had any feelings, they concealed them, and some were for Germany, but it wasn't wise for them to say anything about it. His wife was coming out of the house to meet the car, and there were two policemen climbing out of it. One looked like the captain himself, Van Jarsveld, one of the most popular men in the village, a great rugby, rugby player in his day and a soldier of the Great War. He supposed they picked their officers carefully for an English-speaking district like Asopo. They seemed to have come to see him, for his wife was pointing up to the tops. He prepared to go down, but before he left, he looked over the Great Valley. There was no rain, and nothing that looked as if it would ever come. He called his dog and set out along the path that would soon drop down steeply amongst the stones. When he reached a little plateau about halfway down to the fields, he found that Van Jarsveld and Benedict was already climbing the slope and saw that they had brought their car down the rough track to the plowing. They caught sight of him and he waved to them and sat down upon a stone to wait for them. Benedict dropped behind and the captain came on above to meet him. Well, captain, have you brought some rain for us? The captain stopped and looked, turned to look over the valley to the mountains beyond. I don't see any, Mr. Jarvis, he said. Neither do I. What brings you out today? They shook hands and the captain looked at him. Mr. Jarvis, yes, I have bad news for you. Bad news? Jarvis sat down, his heart beating loudly. Is it my son? he asked. Yes, Mr. Jarvis. Is he dead? Yes, Mr. Jarvis, the captain paused. He was shot dead at 1.30 p.m. this afternoon in Johannesburg. Jarvis stood up, his mouth quivering. Shot dead, he asked. By whom? It is suspected by a native housekeeper. You know, his wife was away. 
Yes, I knew that, and he stayed at home for the day as slight indisposition. I suppose this native thought no one was at home. It appears that your son heard a noise and came down to investigate. The native shot him dead. There was no sign of any struggle. My God, I'm sorry, Mr. Jarvis. I'm sorry to have to bring this news to you. He offered his hand, but Jarvis had sat down again on the stone. It did not see it. My God, he said. Ben Jarisfeld stood silent while the older man tried to control himself. You didn't tell my wife, Captain. No, Mr. Jarvis. Jarvis knitted his brows as he thought of that task that must be performed. She isn't strong, he said. I don't know how she will stand it. Mr. Jarvis, I am instructed to offer you every assistance. Benedek can drive your car to Peter Maritzburg if you wish. You could catch the fast mail at nine o'clock. You will be in Johannesburg at 11 tomorrow morning. There's a private compartment reserved for you and Mrs. Jarvis. That was kind of you. I do anything you wish, Mr. Jarvis. What time is it? Half past three, Mr. Jarvis. Two hours ago? Yes, Mr. Jarvis. Three hours ago he was alive. Yes, Mr. Jarvis. My God. If you are to catch this train, you should leave at six. Or if you wish, you could take an aeroplane. There's one waiting at Peter Moritzburg, but we must let them know by four o'clock. You could be in Johannesburg at midnight. Yes, yes, you know I cannot think. Yes, I can understand that. Which would be better? I think the aeroplane, Mr. Jarvis. Well, we'll take it. We must let them know, you say? I'll do that as soon as we get to the house. Can I telephone where Mrs. Jarvis won't hear me? I must hurry, you see. Yes, yes, you can do that. I think we should go. But Jarvis sat without moving. Can you stand up, Mr. Jarvis? I don't want I don't want to help you. Your wife's watching us. She's wandering, Captain. Even at this distance, she knows something's wrong. It's quite likely. Something she saw in my face, perhaps, though I tried not to show it. Jarvis stood up. My God, he said. There's still that to do. As they walked down the steep path, Benedek went ahead of them. Jarvis walked like a dazed man. Out of a cloudless sky, these things come. Shot dead, he said. Yes, Mr. Jarvis. Did they catch the native? Not yet, Mr. Jarvis. The tears filled the eyes. The teeth bit the lip. What does that matter, he said. They walked down the hill. They were near the field. Through the misted eyes, he saw the plow turn over the clods, then ride high over the iron ground. Leave it, Thomas, he said. This was our only child, Captain. I know that, Mr. Jarvis. They climbed into the car and in a few minutes were at the house. James, what's the matter? Some trouble, my dear. Come with me to the office. Captain, you want to use the telephone. You know where it is? Yes, Mr. Jarvis. The captain went to the telephone. It was a party line and two neighbors were talking. Please put down your receivers, said the captain. This is an urgent call from the police. Please put down your receivers. He rang viciously and got no answer. There should be a special police call to exchange on these county lines. He would see about it. He rang more viciously. Exchange, he said. Police? Peter Moritzburg, it's very urgent. You will be connected immediately, said Exchange. He waited impatiently, listening to the queer, inexplicable noises. Your call to police, Peter Moritzburg, said Exchange. He started to talk to them about the aeroplane. His hand felt for the second earpiece, so that he could use that also to shut out the sound of the woman, of her crying and sobbing. Chapter 19 A young man met them at the airport. Mr. and Mrs. Jarvis? Yes, I'm John Harrison, Mary's brother. I don't think you remember me. I was only a youngster when you saw me last. Let me carry your things. I have a car here for you. As they walked to the control building, the young man said, 
I needn't tell you how grieved we are, Mr. Jarvis. Arthur was the finest man I ever knew. In the car, he spoke to them again. Mary and the children are at my mother's, and we're expecting you both to stay with us. How is Mary? She's suffering from the shock, Mr. Jarvis, but she's very brave. And the children? They've taken it very badly, Mr. Jarvis, and that has given Mary something to occupy herself. They did not speak again. Jarvis held his wife's hand, but they all were silent with their own thoughts until they drove through the gates of a suburban house and came to a stop before a lighted porch. A young woman came out at the sound of the car and embraced Mrs. Jarvis as they wept together. Then she turned to Jarvis, and they embraced each other. This first meeting over, Mr. and Mrs. Harrison came out also and after they had welcomed one another, and after the proper words had been spoken, they all went into the house. Harrison turned to Jarvis. Would you like a drink? he asked. It would be welcome. Come to my study then. And now, said Harrison, you must do as you wish. If there's anything we can do, you've only to ask us. If you would wish to go to the mortuary at once, John will go with you. Or you can go tomorrow morning if you wish. The police would like to see you, but they won't worry you tonight. I'll ask my wife, Harrison. You know we've hardly spoken of it yet. I'll go to her. Don't you worry to come. I'll wait for you here. He found his wife and his daughter-in-law hand in hand, tiptoeing out of the room where his grandchildren were sleeping. He spoke to her, and she wept again and sobbed against him. Now, she said, he went back to Harrison and swallowed his drink, and then he and his wife and their daughter-in-law went out to the car, where John Harrison was waiting for them. While they were driving to the police laboratories, John Harrison told Jarvis all that he knew about the crime, how the police were waiting for the houseboy to recover consciousness, and how they had combed the plantations on Parkwood Ridge. And he told him, too, of the paper that Arthur Jarvis had been writing just before he was killed, on the truth about native crime. I'd like to see it, said Jarvis. We'll get it for you tomorrow, Mr. Jarvis. My son and I didn't see eye to eye on the native question, John. In fact, he and I got quite heated about it on more than one occasion. But I'd like to see what he wrote. My father and I don't see eye to eye on the native question either, Mr. Jarvis. You know, Mr. Jarvis, there was no one in South Africa who thought so deeply about it, and no one who thought so clearly as Arthur did. And what else is there to think deeply and clearly about in South Africa, he used to say. So they came to the laboratories, and John Harrison stayed in the car, while the others went to do the hard thing that had to be done and they came out silent, but for the weeping of the two women, and drove back as silently to the house, while Mary's father opened the door to them. Another drink, Jarvis, or do you want to go to bed? Margaret, do you want me to come up with you? No, my dear, stay and have your drink. Good night then, my dear. Good night, James. He kissed her, and she clung to him for a moment, and thank you for all your help, she said. The tears came again into her eyes, and into his, too, for that matter. He watched her climb the stairs with her daughter-in-law, and when the door closed on them, he and Harrison turned to go to the study. It's always worse for the mother, Jarvis. Yes. He pondered over it and then said, I was very fond of my son, he said. I was never ashamed of having him. They settled down to their drinks, and Harrison told him that the murder had shocked the people of Parkwood, and how the messages had poured into the house. Messages from every conceivable place, every kind of person, he said. By the way, Jarvis, we arranged the funeral provisionally for tomorrow afternoon. After a service in the Parkwood church, three o'clock the service will be. Jarvis nodded. Thank you, he said. And we kept all the messages for you from the bishop and the acting prime minister and the mayor and from dozens of others and from native organizations too, something called the Daughters of Africa and a whole lot of others that I can't remember and from colored people and Indians and Jews. Jarvis felt a sad pride rising in him. He was clever, he said. That came from his mother. 
He was that right enough. You must hear John on it. But people liked him too, all sorts of people. You know he spoke Afrikaans like an Afrikaner. I knew he had learnt it. It's a lingo I know nothing about, thank God. But he thought he ought to know it, so he took lessons in it and went to an Afrikaner farm. He spoke Zulu, as you know, but he was talking of learning Sesetu. You know these native MPs they have, well, there was talk of getting him to stand at the next election. I didn't know that. Yes, he was always speaking here and there. You know the kind of thing. Native crime and more native schools, and he kicked up a heck of a dust in the papers about the conditions at the non-European hospital. And you know, he was hot about the native compound system in the mines and wanted the chamber to come out 100% for settled labor, you know, wife and family to come with the man. Jarvis filled his pipe slowly and listened to this tale of his son, to this tale of a stranger. Hathaway of the Chamber of Mines spoke to me about it, said Harrison. Asked me if I wouldn't warn the lad to pipe down a bit, because his firm did a lot of business with the mines. So I spoke to him, told him I knew he felt deeply about these things, but asked him to go slow a bit. Told him there was Mary to consider and the children. I didn't speak on behalf of Mary, you understand? I don't poke my nose into young people's business. I understand. I've spoken to Mary, he said to me. She and I agree that it's more important to speak the truth than to make money. Harrison laughed at that, but cut himself short, remembering the sadness of the occasion. My son John was there, he said, looking at Arthur as though he were God Almighty. So what could I say? They smoked in silence a while. I asked him, said Harrison, about his partners. After all, their job was to sell machinery to the mines. I've discussed it with my partners, he said to me, and if there's any trouble, I've told them I'll get out. And what would you do? I asked him. I won't, I do. What won't I do? He said. His face was sort of excited. Well, what could I say more? Jarvis did not answer, for this boy of his had gone journeying in strange waters, further than his parents had known, or perhaps his mother knew. It would not surprise him if his mother knew, but he himself had never done such journeying, and there was nothing he could say. Am I tiring you, Jarvis, or is there perhaps something else you'd like to talk about, or go to bed, perhaps? Harrison, you're doing me more good by talking. Well, that's how it was. He and I didn't talk much about these things. It's not my line of country. I try to treat a native decently, but he's not my food and drink. And to tell you the truth, these crimes put me off. I tell you, Jarvis, we're scared stiff at the moment in Johannesburg. Of crime? Yes, of native crime. There are too many of these murders and robberies and brutal attacks. I tell you, we don't go to bed at night without barricading the house. It was at the Philipsons, three doors down, that a gang of these rough broke in. They knocked old Philipson unconscious and beat up his wife. It was lucky the girls were out at a dance, or one doesn't know what might have happened. I asked Arthur about that, but he reckoned we were to blame somehow. Can't say I always followed him, but he had a kind of sincerity. You sort of felt that if you had the time, you could get some sort of sense out of it. There's one thing I don't get the sense of, said Jarvis, why this should have happened. You mean to him, of all people? Yes, that's one of the first things that we said. Here he was, day in and day out, on a kind of mission, and it was he who was killed. Mind you, said Jarvis, coming to a point, mind you, it's happened before. I mean that missionaries were killed. Harrison made no answer, and they smoked their pipes silently. A missionary, thought Jarvis, and thought how strange it was that he had called his son a missionary, for he had never thought much of missionaries. True, the church made a lot of it, and there were special appeals to which he had given, but one did that kind of thing without believing much in missionaries. There was a mission near him at Nodetsheni, but it was a sad place as he remembered it. 
A dirty old wooden iron church, patched and forlorn, and a dirty old parson in a barren valley where the grass hardly grew. A dirty old school where he had heard them reciting, parrot fashion, on the one or two occasions that he had ridden past there, reciting things that could mean little to them. Bed, Jarvis, or another drink? Bed, I think. Did you say the police were coming? They're coming at nine. And I'd like to see the house. I thought that you would. They'll take you there. Good, then I'll go to bed. Will you say good night to your wife for me? I'll do that. You know your room? And breakfast? 8.30? 8.30. Good night, Harrison. And many thanks for your kindness. No thanks are needed. Nothing is too much trouble. Good night, Jarvis, and I hope you and Margaret will get some sleep. Jarvis walked up the stairs and went into the room. He walked in quietly and closed the door and did not put on the light. The moon was shining through the windows, and he stood there looking out on the world. All that he had heard went quietly through his mind. His wife turned in the bed and said, James, my dear, what were you thinking, my dear? He was silent, searching for an answer. Of it all, he said. I thought you would never come. He went to her quickly, and she caught at his hands. We were talking of the boy, he said, all that he did and tried to do, all the people that are grieved. Tell me, my dear. And so he told her in low tones all he had heard. She marveled a little, for her husband was a quiet, silent man, not given to much talking. But tonight he told her all that Harrison had told him. It makes me proud, she whispered. But you always knew he was like that. Yes, I knew. I knew, too, that he was a decent man, he said, but you were always nearer to him than I was. It's easier for Mother James. I suppose so, but I wish now that I'd known more of him. You see the things that he did. I've never had much to do with that sort of thing. Nor I either, James. His life was quite different from ours. It was a good life by all accounts. He lay... He sat, she lay, in silence with their thoughts and their memories and their grief. Although his life was different, he said, you understood it. Yes, James, I'm sorry I didn't understand it. Then he said in a whisper, I didn't know it would ever be so important to understand it. My dear, my dear, her arms went about him and she wept, and he continued to whisper. There's one thing I don't understand, why it should have happened to him. She lay there thinking of it. The pain was deep, deep and ineluctable. She tightened her arms about him. James, let's try to sleep, she said. Chapter 20 Jarvis sat in the chair of his son, and his wife and Mary left him to return to the Harrisons. Books, 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 more books than he had ever seen in a house. On the table, papers, letters, and more books. Mr. Jarvis, will you speak at the Parkwood Methodist Guild? Mr. Jarvis, will you speak at the Anglican Young People's Association in Sophia Town? Mr. Jarvis, will you speak in a symposium at the university? No, Mr. Jarvis would be unable to speak at any of these. Mr. Jarvis, you are invited to the annual meeting of the Society of Jews and Christians. Mr. Jarvis, you and your wife are invited to the wedding of Sarah Ginny eldest daughter of Mr. and Mrs. H. B. Sign. Mr. Jarvis, you and your wife are invited to a Talk H. guest night in Van Wyke's Valley. No, Mr. Jarvis would be uh, unable to accept these kind of invitations. On the wall between the books, there were four pictures of Christ crucified and Abraham Lincoln and the white gabled house of Vergelican and a painting of leafless willows by a river in a wintry veld. He rose from the chair to look at the books. Here were hundreds of books, all about Abraham Lincoln. He had not known that so many books had been written about any one man. One bookcase was full of them, and another was full of books about South Africa. Sarah Gertrude, Malin's Life of Rhodes, and her book about Smuts, and Engelenberg's Life of Louis Botha, and books on South African race problems and books on South African birds, and the Kruger Park and innumerable others. Another bookcase was full of Africans' books, but the titles conveyed nothing to him. 
And here were books about religion and Soviet Russia and crime and criminals and books of poems. He looked for Shakespeare, and here was Shakespeare too. He went back to the chair and looked long at the pictures of Christ crucified and Abraham Lincoln and Virgil Legan and the willows by the river. Then he drew some pieces of paper towards him. The first was a letter to his son from the secretary of the Claremont African Boys Club, Gladiola Street, Claremont, regretting that Mr. Jarvis had not been able to attend the annual meeting of the club and informing him he had again been elected as president. And the letter concluded with quaintness of phrase. I am compelled by the annual meeting to congratulate you with this matter and to express considerable thanks to you for all the time you have been spending with us and for the present you have been giving the club. How this club would be arranged without your participation would be a mystery to many minds amongst us. It is on these accounts that we desire to elect you again to the presidency. I am asking an apology for this writing paper, but our club writing paper is lost owing to unforeseen circumstances. I am your obedient servant, Washington Lefell. The other papers were in his son's handwriting. They were obviously part of some larger whole, for the first line was the latter end of a sentence, and the last line was a sentence unrefinished. He looked for the rest of it, but finding nothing, settled down to read what he had, was permissible. What we did when we came to South Africa was permissible. It was permissible to develop our great resources with the aid of what labor we could find. It was permissible to use unskilled men for unskilled work. But it is not permissible to keep men unskilled for the sake of unskilled work. It was permissible when we discovered gold to bring labor to the mines. It was permissible to build compounds and to keep women and children away from the towns. It was permissible as an experiment in the light of what we knew. But in the light of what we know now, with certain exceptions, it is no longer permissible. It is not permissible for us to go on destroying family life when we know that we are destroying it. It is permissible to develop any resources if the labor is forthcoming. But it is not permissible to develop any resources if they can be developed only at the cost of the labor. It is not permissible to mine any gold or manufacture any product or cultivate any land if such mining and manufacture and cultivation depend for their success on a policy of keeping labor poor. It is not permissible to add to one's possessions if these things can only be done at the cost of other men. Such development has only one true name, and that is exploitation. It might have been permissible in the early days of our country, before we became aware of its cost, in the disintegration of native community life, in the deterioration of native family life, in poverty, slums, and crime. But now that the cost is known, it is no longer permissible. It was permissible to leave native education to those who wanted to develop it. It was permissible to doubt its benefits. But it is no longer permissible in the light of what we know, partly because it made possible industrial development, and partly because it happened in spite of us, that there is now a large urbanized native population. Now society has always, for reasons of self-interest, if for no other, educated its children so that they grow up law-abiding with socialized aims and purposes. There is no other way that can be done. Yet we continue to leave the education of our native urban society to those few Europeans who feel strongly about it, and to deny opportunities and money for its expansion. It is not permissible for reasons of self-interest alone, it is dangerous. It was permissible to allow the destruction of a tribal system that impeded the growth of the country. It was permissible to believe that its destruction was inevitable. But it is not permissible to watch its destruction and to replace it by nothing or by so little. That a whole people deteriorates physically and morally. The old tribal system was, for all its violence and savagery, for all its superstition and witchcraft, a moral system. 
Our natives today produce criminals and prostitutes and drunkards, not because it is their nature to do so, but because their simple system of order and tradition and convention has been destroyed. It was destroyed by the impact of our own civilization. Our civilization has therefore an inescapable duty to set up another system of order and tradition and convention. It is true that we hope to preserve the tribal system by a policy of segregation. That was permissible, but we never did it thoroughly or honestly. We set aside one-tenth of the land for four-fifths of the people. Thus we made it inevitable, and some say we did it knowingly, that labor would come to the towns. We are caught in the toils of our own selfishness. No one wishes to make the problem seem smaller than it is. No one wishes to make its solution seem easy. No one wishes to make light of the fears that beset us. But whether we be fearful or no, we shall never, because we are a Christian people, be able to evade the moral issues. It is time. And there the manuscript and the page ended. Jarvis, who had become absorbed in the reading, searched again amongst the papers on the table, but he could find nothing to show that anything more than this had been written. He lit his pipe and, pulling the papers toward him, began to read them again. After he had finished them the second time, he sat smoking his pipe and lost in thought. Then he got up from his chair and went and stood in front of the Lincoln bookcase and looked up at the picture of the man who had exercised such an influence over his son. He looked at the hundreds of books and slid aside the glass panel and took one of them out. Then he turned to his chair and began to turn over its pages. One of the chapters was headed, the famous speech at Gettysburg, apparently a speech that was a failure but that had since become one of the great speeches of the world. He turned over the preliminary pages till he came to the speech and read it thoroughly through carefully. That done he smoked again, lost in a deep abstraction. After some time he rose and replaced the book in the case and shut the case. Then he opened the case again and slipped the book into his pocket and shut the case. He looked at his watch, knocked out his pipe in the fireplace, put on his hat, took up his stick. He walked slowly down the stairs and opened the door into the fatal passage. He took off his hat and looked down at the dark stain on the floor. Unasked, unwanted, the picture of the small boy came into his mind, the small boy at High Place, the small boy with the wooden guns. Unseeing, he walked along the passage and out of the door through which death had come so suddenly. The policeman saluted him, and he answered him with words that meant nothing, that made no sense at all. He put on his hat and walked to the gate. Undecided, he looked up and down the road. Then, when it, with an effort, he began to walk. With a sigh, the policeman relaxed. Chapter 21 The service in the Parkwood Church was over, and the church had been too small for all who wanted to come. White people, black people, colored people, Indians. It was the first time that Jarvis and his wife had sat in a church with people who were not white. The bishop himself had spoken, words that pained and uplifted. And the bishop, too, had said that men did not understand this riddle. Why a young man so full of promise was cut off in his youth. Why a woman was widowed and children were orphaned why a country was bereft of one who might have served it greatly. And the bishop's voice rose when he spoke of South Africa, and he spoke in a language of beauty, and Jarvis listened for a while without pain, under the spell of the words. And the bishop said that here had been a life devoted to South Africa, of intelligence and courage, of love that cast out fear, so that the pride welled up in the heart, pride in the stranger who had been his son. The funeral was over, the brass doors opened soundlessly, and the coffin slid soundlessly into the furnace that would reduce it to ashes. And people that he did not know shook hands with him, some speaking their sympathy in brief conventional phrases, some speaking simply of his son. The black people, yes, the black people also. It was the first time he had ever shaken hands with black people. They returned to the house of the Harrisons for the night that is supposed to be worst of all the nights that must come. 
For Margaret, it would be no doubt be so. He would not leave her again to go to bed alone. But for him, it was over. He could sit quietly in Harrison's study and drink his whiskey and smoke his pipe and talk about any matter that Harrison wanted to talk about, even about his son. How long will you stay, Jarvis? You're welcome to stay as long as you wish. Thank you, Harrison. I think Margaret will go back with Mary and the children, and we'll arrange for the son of one of my neighbors to stay with them. A nice lad, just out of the army. But I'll stay to wind up Arthur's affairs, at least in the preliminary stages. And what did the police say, if I may ask? They're still waiting for the boy to recover. They have hopes that he recognized one of them. Otherwise, they say it will be very difficult. The whole thing was over so quickly. They hope, too, that someone may have seen them getting away. They think they were frightened and excited and wouldn't have walked away normally. I hope to God they get them and string them all up. Pardon me, Jarvis. I know exactly what you mean. We're not safe, Jarvis. I don't even know that stringing them up will make us safe. Sometimes I think it's got to be on us. I know what you mean, but myself, perhaps it's too soon to think about it. I know what you mean. I understand. I kind of understand. That side of it isn't the side you feel most about. It might be the same. I don't really know. I don't really know either. But you're right. It's not that side of it that seems important. Not yet, anyway. But I realize there is another side to it. We've been agitating for more police, Jarvis. There's going to be a big meeting in Parkwood tomorrow night. The place is alive with indignation. You know, Jarvis, there's hardly a householder in these suburbs who knows who lives in the servants' quarters. I won't have it. I tell my servants that I won't have a stranger near the place, let alone allow him to sleep here. Our girl's husband comes in occasionally from the place where he works, Benoni or Springs or somewhere, and she brings him in decently and I give permission. But I'll allow no one else. If I didn't look out, I'd have the place full of cousins and uncles and brothers and most of them up to no good. Yes, I suppose that happens in Johannesburg. And these sanitary lanes that run behind the houses, we've urged them to close the darn things up now that we have proper sewerage. They're dark and dangerous, and these darn loafers use them as hideouts. God knows what's coming to the country. I don't. I'm not a blank hater, Jarvis. I try to give them a square deal, decent wages and a clean room, and reasonable time off. Our servants stay with us for years, but the natives as a whole are getting out of hand. They've even started trade unions. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Well, they have. They're threatening to strike here in the mines for 10 shillings a day. They get about three shillings a shift now, and some of the mines are on the verge of closing down. They live in decent compounds. Some of the latest compounds I wouldn't mind living in myself. They get good, balanced food, far better than that ever get at home, free medical attention, and God knows what. I tell you, Jarvis, if mining costs go up much more, there won't be any mines. And where will South Africa be then? And where would the natives be themselves that die by the thousands of starvation? Am I intruding, asked John Harrison, come in to his father's study? Sit down, John, said Harrison. So the young man sat down, and his father, who was growing warm and excited, proceeded to develop his theme. And where would the farmers be, Jarvis? Where would you sell your products, and who could afford to buy them? There wouldn't be any subsidies. There wouldn't be any industry either. Industry depends on the mines to provide the money that will buy its products. And this government of ours soaks the mines every year for a cool 70% of the profits. And where would they be if there were no mines? Half the Afrikaners in the country would be out of work. There wouldn't be any civil service either. Half of them would be out of work too. He poured out some more whiskey for them both and then resumed his subject. I tell you, there wouldn't be any South Africa at all if it weren't for the mines. You could shut the place up and give it back to the natives. That's what makes me so angry when people criticize the mine, especially the Afrikaners. They have some full notion that the mining people are foreign to the country and are sucking the blood out of it, ready to clear out when the goose stops laying the eggs. 
I'm telling you that most of the mining shares are held here in the country itself. They're our mines. I get sick and tired of all this talk. Republic. Where would we be if we ever got a republic? Harrison, I'm going to bed. I don't want Margaret to go to bed alone. Oh, man, I'm sorry. I'm afraid I forgot myself. There's nothing to be sorry about. It's done me good to listen to you. I haven't done much talking myself. It's not because I'm not interested. I'm sure you understand. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, said Harrison humbly. I quite forgot myself. Believe me, said Jarvis. I'm sincere when I say it's done me good to listen to you. He looked at the two Harrisons. I'm not a man to sit and talk about death by the hour, he said. Harrison looked at him uncomfortably. Really? Really? You make it easy for me, he said. I could have wished that he were here tonight, said Jarvis, that I could have heard him argue with you. You would have enjoyed it, Mr. Jarvis, said John Harrison, eagerly responding to this natural invitation to talk about a man no, not long since dead. I never heard anyone argue about these things as he could. I didn't agree with him, said Harrison, his discomfort passing, but I had a great respect for anything that he said. He was a good man, Harrison. I'm not sorry that we had him. Good night to you. Good night, Jarvis. Did you sleep last night? Did Margaret sleep? We both got some sleep. I hope you get some more tonight. Don't forget the house is at your service. Thank you. Good night. John? Yes, Mr. Jarvis? Do you know the boys' club in Gladiolus Road, Claremont? I know it well. It was our club, Arthur's and mine. I should like to see it, any time that suits. I'd be glad to take you, Mr. Jarvis. And Mr. Jarvis? Yes, John? I want to tell you that when your father says Afrikaners, he means nationalist. Arthur was always telling him that. And father would agree, too. But he just doesn't seem able to remember. Jarvis smiled, first at the boy, then at his father. It's a good point, he said. Good night, Harrison. Good night, John. The next morning, Harrison waited for his guest at the foot of the stairs. Come into the study, he said. They went in, and Harrison closed the door behind him. The police have just telephoned, Jarvis. The boy recovered consciousness this morning. He says there were three right enough. They had their mouths and noses covered, but he is sure that the one that knocked him out was an old garden boy of Mary's. Mary had to get rid of him for some trouble or other. He recognized him because of some twitching about the eyes. When he left Mary, he got a job at some textile factory in Dornfontein. Then he left the factory, and no one can say where he went. But they got information about some other native who had been very friendly with him. They're after him now, hoping that he can tell them where to find the garden boy. They certainly seem to be moving. They do seem to be. And here is a copy of Arthur's manuscript on native crime. Shall I leave it on the table and you can read it in peace after breakfast? Thank you. Leave it there. How did you sleep? And Margaret? She slept heavily, Harrison. She needed it. I'm sure she did. Come to breakfast. After breakfast, Jarvis returned to his host's study and began to read his son's manuscript. He turned first to the last page of it and read with pain the last unfinished paragraph. This was almost the last thing that his son had done. When this was done, he had been alive. Then at this moment, at this very word that hung in the air, he got up and gone down the stairs to his death. If one could have cried then, don't go down. If one could have cried, stop, there's danger. But there was no one to cry. No one knew then what so many knew now. But these thoughts were unprofitable. It was not his habit to dwell on what might have been, but what could never be. There was no point in imagining that if one had been there, one could have prevented a thing that had happened only because it had not been prevented. It was the pain that did it, that compelled one to these unprofitable thoughts. He wanted to understand his son, not to desire what was no more accessible to desire. He so compelled himself to read the last paragraph slowly, with his head, not his heart, so that he could understand it. The truth is that our Christian civilization is riddled through and through with dilemma. 
We believe in the brotherhood of man, but we do not want it in South Africa. We believe that God endows men with diverse gifts and that human life depends for its fullness on their employment and enjoyment. But we are afraid to explore this belief too deeply. We believe in help for the underdog, but we want him to stay under. And we are therefore compelled in order to preserve our belief that we are Christian to ascribe to Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, and our own human intentions, and to say that because he created white and black. He gives the divine approval to any human action that is designed to keep black men from advancement. We go so far as to credit Almighty God with having created black men to hew wood and draw water for white men. We go so far as to assume that he blesses any action that is designed to prevent black men from the full employment of the gifts he gave them. Alongside of these very arguments, we use others totally inconsistent so that the accusation of repression may be refuted. We say we withhold education because the black child has not the intelligence to profit by it. We withhold opportunity to develop gifts because black people have no gifts. We justify our action by saying that it took us thousands of years to achieve our own advancement. And it would be foolish to suppose that it would take the black man any lesser time and that therefore there is no need for hurry. We shift our ground again when a black man does achieve something remarkable and feel deep pity for a man who is condemned to the loneliness of being remarkable and decided that it is a Christian kindness not to let black men become remarkable. Thus, even our God becomes a confused and inconsistent creature, giving gifts and denying them employment. It is strange then that our civilization is riddled through and through with dilemma. The truth is that our civilization is not Christian. It is a tragic compound of great ideal and fearful practice, of high assurance and desperate anxiety, of loving charity and fearful clutching of possessions. Allow me a minute. Jarvis sat deeply moved, whether because this was his son, whether because this was almost the last act of his son, he could not say. Whether because there was some quality in the words, that too he could not say, for he had given little time in his life to the savoring and judging of words. Whether because there was some quality in the ideas, that too he could not say, for he had given little time to the study of these particular matters. He rose up and went up the stairs to his room and was glad to find his wife not there, for here was a sequence not to be interrupted. He picked up the Abraham Lincoln and went down to the study again, and there opened the book of the second inaugural address of the great president. He read it through and felt with a sudden lifting of the spirit that here was a secret unfolding, a track picked up again. There was increasing knowledge of a stranger. He began to understand why the picture of this man was in the house of his son and the multitude of books. He picked up the page again, but for his son, not for the words or the ideas. He looked at the words. Allow me a minute, and nothing more. Those fingers could not write any more. Allow me a minute. I hear a sound in the kitchen. Allow me a minute while I go to my death. Allow me a thousand minutes. I am not coming back any more. Jarvis shook it off and put another match to his pipe, and after he had read the paper through, sat in a reverie smoking. James? He started. Yes, my dear, he said. You shouldn't sit by yourself, she said. He smiled at her. It's not my nature to brood, he said. Then what have you been doing? Thinking, not brooding, thinking, and reading. This is what I have been reading. She took it, looked at it, and held it against her breast. Read it, he said quietly. It's worth reading. So she sat down to read it, and he, watching her, knew what she would do. She turned to the last page, to the last words. Allow me a minute, and sat looking at them. She looked at him. She was going to speak. He accepted that. Pain does not go away so quickly. Chapter 22 At the head of the court is a high seat where the judge sits, 
Down below it is a table for officers of the court, and to the left and to the right of the table are other seats. Some of these seats form a block that is enclosed, and they are for the jury if there is a jury. In front of the table are other seats, arranged in arcs of circles, with curved tables in front of the seats, and it is there that the lawyer sits. And behind them is the dock, with a passage leading to some place that is underground, and from this place that is underground will be brought the men that are to be judged. At the back of the court there are seats rising in tiers, those on the right for Europeans, those on the left for non-Europeans, according to the custom. You may not smoke in this court, you may not whisper or speak or laugh. You must dress decently, and if you are a man, you may not wear your hat unless such is your religion. This is in honor of the judge and in honor of the king, whose officer he is, and in honor of the law behind the judge and in honor of the people behind the law. When the judge enters, you will stand, and you will not sit till he is seated. When the judge leaves, you will stand, and you will not move till he has left you. This is in honor of the judge and of the things behind the judge. For the judge is entrusted a great duty to judge and to pronounce sentence, even sentence of death. Because of their high office, judges are called honorable and precede most other men on great occasions, and they are held in great honor by both white and black. Because the land is a land of fear, a judge must be without fear, so that justice may be done according to the law. Therefore, a judge must be incorruptible. The judge does not make the law. It is the people that make the law. Therefore, if a law is unjust, and if the judge judges according to the law, that is justice, even if it is not just. It is the duty of a judge to do justice but it is only the people that can be just. Therefore, if justice be not just, it is not to be laid at the door of the judge, but at the door of the people, which means at the door of the white people, for it is the white people that make the law. In South Africa, men are proud of their judges because they believe they are incorruptible. Even the black men have faith in them, though they do not always have faith in the law. In a land of fear, this incorruptibility is like a lamp set upon a stand, giving light to all that are in the house. They call for silence in the court, and the people stand. Even if there were one there greater than the judge, he would stand, for behind the judge are things greater than any man. And the judge enters with his two assessors, and they sit. And then the people sit also. The court is begun. From the place under the ground come the three that are to be judged, and all the people look at them. Some people think that they look like murderers, they even whisper it, though it is dangerous to whisper. Some people think they do not look like murderers, and some think this one looks like a murderer, but that one does not. A white man stands up and says that these three are accused of the murder of Arthur, Trevelyan Jarvis in his house at Plantation Road, Parkwood, Johannesburg, on Tuesday, the 8th day of October, 1946, in the early afternoon. The first is Absalom Kumalu, the second is Matthew Kumalu, the third is Johannes Pafuri. They are called upon to plead guilty or not guilty, and the first says, I plead guilty to killing, but I did not mean to kill. The second says, I am not guilty, and the third likewise. Everything is said in English and in Zulu, so that these three may understand. For though Pafuri is not Zulu, he understands it well, he says. The lawyer, the white man who is taking the case for God, says that Absalom Kumalu will plead guilty to culpable homicide, but not to murder, for he had no intention to kill. But the prosecutor says there is no charge of culpable homicide, for it is murder and nothing less than murder, with which he is charged. So Absalom Kamalu pleads, like the other two, two others, not guilty. Then the prosecutor speaks for a long time and tells the court the whole story of the crime. And Absalom Kamalu is still and silent, but the other two look grieved and shocked to think such things are said. 
Then after this plan was made, you decided on this day, the eighth day of October. That is so. Why did you choose this day? Because Johannes said that no one would be in the house. This same Johannes Perfuri, this same Johannes Perfuri who is charged with me now. And you choose this time of half past one? That is so. Was it not a bad time to choose? White people come home to eat at this time. But the accused makes no answer. Why did you choose this time? It was Johannes who chose this time. He said it was told to him by a voice. What voice? No, that I do not know. An evil voice? And again, there is no answer. Then you three went to the back door of the house. That is so. You and these two who are charged with you? I and these two very two. And then? Then we tied the handkerchiefs over our mouths. And then? Then we went into the kitchen. Who was there? The servant of the house was there. Richard Mappering? No, I do not know his name. Is this the man here? Yes, that is the man. And then tell the court what happened. This man was afraid. He saw my revolver. He stood back against the sink where he was working. He said, what do you want? Johanna said, we want money and clothes. This man said, you cannot do such a thing. Johanna says, you do what, do you want to die? This man was afraid and did not speak. Johanna said, when I speak, people must tremble. Then he said again, do you want to die? The man said nothing, but he suddenly called out, Master, Master. Then Johanna struck him over the head with the iron bar that he had behind his back. How many times did he strike him? Once. Did he call out again? He made no sound. What did you do? No, we were silent. Johanna said we must be silent. What did you do? Did you listen? We listened. Did you hear anything? We heard nothing. Where was your revolver? In my hand. And then? Then a white man came into the passage. And then? I was frightened. I fired the revolver. And then? The accused looked down at the floor. The white man fell, he said. And then? Johanna said, quickly, we must go. So we all went quickly. To the back gate? Yes. And then over the road into the plantation? Yes. Did you stay together? No, I went alone. And when did you see these two again? At the house of baby Kizi. But the judge interrupts. You may proceed shortly with your examination, Mr. Prosecutor, but I have one or two questions to ask the first accused. As your lordship pleases, why did you carry this revolver? I was to frighten the servant of the house. But why do you carry any revolver? The boy is silent. You must answer my question. They told me to carry it. Who told you? No, they told me Johannesburg was dangerous. Who told you that? The boy is silent. You mean you were told by the kind of man who is engaged in this business of breaking in and stealing? No, I do not mean that. Well, who told you? I do not remember. It was said in some place where I was. You mean you were all sitting there and some man said, one needs a revolver in Johannesburg. It is dangerous. Yes, I mean that. And you knew this revolver was loaded? Yes, I knew it. If this revolver is to frighten people, why must it be loaded? But the boy did not answer. You were therefore ready to shoot with it? No, I would not have shot a decent person. I would have shot only if someone had shot at me. Would you have shot at a policeman if he had shot at you in the execution of his duty? No, not at a policeman. The judge pauses and everything is silent. Then he says gravely, and this white man you shot, was he not a decent person? The accused looks down again at the floor. Then he answers in a low voice. I was afraid. I was afraid. I never meant to shoot him. Where did you get this revolver? I bought it from a man. Where? In Alexandra. 
Who is this man? What is his name? I do not know his name. Where does he live? I do not know where he lives. Could you find him? I could try to find him. Was this revolver loaded when you bought it? It had two bullets in it. How many bullets were in it when you went to this house? There was one in it. What happened to the other? I took the revolver into one of the plantations in the hills beyond Alexandra and I fired it there. What did you fire at? I fired at a tree. Did you hit this tree? Yes, I hit it. Then you thought, now I can fire this revolver? Yes, that is so. Who carried the iron bar? Johannes carried it. Did you know he carried it? I knew it. You knew it was a dangerous weapon? That it could kill a man? The boy's voice rises. It was not meant for killing or striking, he said. It was only meant for frightening. But you had a revolver for frightening? Yes, but Johannes said he would take the bar. It had been blessed, he said. It had been blessed? That is what he said. What did Johannes mean when he said the bar had been blessed? I do not know. Did he mean by a priest? I do not know. You did not ask? No, I did not ask. Your father is a priest? The boy looks down again at the floor and in a low voice he answers, yes. Would he bless such a bar? No. You did not say to Johannes, you must not take this bar? No. You did not say to him, how can such a thing be blessed? No. Proceed, Mr. Prosecutor. And if these two say there was no murder discussed at the house of baby McKizzy, they are lying. They are lying. And if they say that you made up this story after meeting them at the house of McKizzy, they are lying? They are lying. And if baby McKizzy says that no murder was discussed in her presence, is she lying? She is lying. She was afraid and said we must leave her house and never return to it. Did you leave together? No, I left first. And where did you go? I went into a plantation. And what did you do there? I buried the revolver. Is this the revolver before the court? The revolver is handed up to the accused and he examines it. This is the revolver, he said. How was it found? No, I told the police where to find it. And what did you do next? I prayed there. The prosecutor seems taken aback for a moment, but the judge says, And what did you pray there? I prayed for forgiveness. And what else did you pray? No, there was nothing else that I wished to pray. And on the second day, you walked again to Johannesburg? Yes. And you again walked among the people who were boycotting the buses? Yes. Were they still talking about the murder? They were still talking. Some said they heard it would soon be discovered. And then I was afraid. So what did you do? That night I went to Germiston. But what did you do that day? Did you hide again? No, I bought a shirt and then I walked about with the parcel. Why did you do that? No, I thought they would think I was a messenger. Was there anything else that you did? There was nothing else. Then you went to Germiston? To what place? To the house of Joseph Bengu at 12 Masaru Street in the location. And then, while I was there, the police came. What happened? They asked me if I was Absalom Kamalu, and I agreed and I was afraid. And I had meant to go that day to confess to the police, and now I could see I had delayed foolishly. Did they arrest you? No, they asked if I could tell them where to find... Johannes. I said, no, I did not know, but it was not Johannes who had killed the white man. It was I myself, but it was Johannes who had struck down the servant of the house. And I told them that Matthew was there also. And I told them that I would show them where I had hidden the revolver. And I told them that I had meant that day to confess, but had delayed foolishly because I was afraid. You then made a statement before Andres Coetis, Esquire, additional magistrate at Johannesburg? I do not know his name. Is this the statement? 
The statement is handed up to the boy. He looks at it and says, yes, that is the statement. Every word is true. Every word is true. There is no lie in it. There is no lie in it, for I said to myself, I shall not lie any more all the rest of my days, nor do anything more that is evil. In fact, you repented? Yes, I repented. Because you were in trouble? Yes, because I was in trouble. Did you have any other reason for repenting? No, I had no other reason. The people stand when the court is adjourned and while the judge and his assessors leave the court. Then they pass out through the doors at the back of the tiers of seats, the Europeans through their doors, and the non-Europeans through their door, according to the custom. Kumalo and Samangu, Gertrude and Mrs. Lithby come out together, and they hear people saying, There is the father of the white man who was killed. And Kumalo looks and sees that he, it is true. There is the father of the man who was murdered, the man who has the farm on the tops above Nodacheni, the man he has seen ridden past the church. And Kumalu trembles and does not look at him any more. For how does one look at such a man? Chapter 23 There is little attention being paid to the trial of those accused of the murder of Arthur Jarvis of Parkwood. For gold has been discovered, more gold, rich gold. There is a little place called Odendalsrust in the province of the Orange Free State. Yesterday it was quite unknown. Today it is one of the famous places of the world. This gold is as rich as any gold that has ever been discovered in South Africa, as rich as anything in Johannesburg. Men are prophesying that a new Johannesburg will rise there, a great city of tall buildings and busy streets. Men that were gloomy because the gold in Johannesburg could not last forever are jubilant and excited. A new lease of life, they say. South Africa is to have a new lease of life. There is excitement in Johannesburg. At the stock exchange, men go mad. They shout and scream and throw their hats in the air for the shares that they had bought in hopes, the shares that they had bought in mines that did not exist. These shares are climbing in price to heights that are beyond expectation. There was nothing there but the flat rolling veld of the orange free state, nothing but sheep and cattle and native herd boys. There was nothing but grass and bushes, and here and there a field of maize. There was nothing there that looked like a mine, except the drilling machines, and the patient engineers probing the mysteries of the earth. Nobody to watch them but a passive native, a herd boy, an old African-speaking farmer that would ride by on his horse, looking at them with contempt or fear or hope, according to his nature. Looking at the wonder share of Tweed Valley, it was a 20 shillings, and then 40 shillings, and then 60 shillings, and then, believe it or not, 80 shillings. And many a man wept because he sold at 12 o'clock instead of 2 o'clock, or because he bought at 2 o'clock instead of 12 o'clock. And the man that sold will feel worse tomorrow morning when the shares go to a 100 shillings. Oh, but it is wonderful. South Africa is wonderful. We shall hold up our heads the higher when we go abroad. And people say, ah, oh, but you are rich in South Africa. Oden Dalrust, what a name of magic. Yet some of them are already saying at the stock market, for their Africans is nothing to wonder at, that there must be a simpler name. What could be easier than Smuts or Smutsville? What could be easier than Hofmeyer? No, but there's a place called Hofmeyer already, and apart from that, well, perhaps it is not quite the name after all. That is the worst of these mines. Their names are unpronounceable. What a pity that a great industry, controlled by such brains, advanced by such enterprise, should be hampered by such unpronounceable names. Blyvorich Zicht and Welge Docht and Langagate and now this Oden Dalwest. But let us say these things in our beards. Let us say them in our clubs. Let us say them in private. For most of us are members of the United Party. That stands for cooperation and fellowship and brotherly love and mutual understanding. But it would save a devil a lot of money 
if Afrikaners could only see that bilingualism was a devil of a waste of it. Gold, gold, gold. The country is going to be rich again. Shares are up from 20 shillings to 100 shillings. Think of it. Thank God for it. There are people, it is true, who are not very thankful. But it must be admitted that they do not hold many shares. Indeed, it must be admitted that some hold no shares at all. Some of these people are speaking in public, and indeed it is interesting and exasperating to some. To note at this point that very often people without shares have quite a trick of words, as though destiny or nature or the life force or whoever controls these things gives some sort of compensation. Not in any kindly way, you understand, but not ironically either, just impersonally. But this is a fanciful idea, and in fact, it might have been better not to have mentioned it. Now, these people with this trick of words, but no financial standing to talk of, speak mostly to small organizations like left clubs and church guilds and societies that promote love and brotherhood. And they write too, but mostly for small publications like New Society and Mankind is Marching and for that extraordinary cross at the crossroads, an obscure eight-page pamphlet brought out weekly by that extraordinary father, B. Resford, who looks as though he hasn't eaten for weeks. But he speaks beautiful English, the kind they speak at Oxford. I mean, not the kind they speak at Rhodes or Stellenbosch. And that makes him acceptable, for he never brushes his hair or has his trousers pressed. He looks for all the world like a converted tiger and has burning eyes. And in fact, he burns bright in the forest of the night, writing his extraordinary paper. He is a missionary and believes in God, intensely I mean, but it takes all kinds to make a world. While some of these people are saying it would be nice if these shares could have stayed at 20 shillings and the other 80 shillings had been used, for example, to erect great anti-erosion works to save the soil of the country. It would have been nice to have subsidized boys clubs and girls clubs and social centers and to have had more hospitals. It would have been nice to have paid more to the miners. Well, anyone can see that this thinking is muddled because the price of shares has really nothing to do with the question of wages at all. This is a matter determined solely by mining costs and the price of gold. And by the way, it is said, too, that there are actually some big men in the mines who hold no shares at all. And this is fine to think of, because it must really be a temptation. In any case, we mustn't be too gloomy, as we might be disposed to be when we think that this 80 shillings has gone into something that isn't any different from what it was before the 80 shillings went into it. Let us look at it in another way. When shares rise from 20 shillings to 100 shillings, someone makes 80 shillings, not necessarily one man, because that would be too good to be true and entitle such a man to be known as a financial wizard and as a figure behind the government. It is more likely that several men will share this 80 shillings because they get nervous and sell out while the share has a lot of kick in it. It's true, of course, that these men don't actually work for this money. I mean, actually sweat and callous their hands. But a man must get something for his courage and foresight, and there's mental strain, too, to be taken into consideration. Now, these men will spend the 80 shillings and make more work for other people, so that the country will be richer for the 80 shillings. And many of them give generously to the boys' clubs and girls' clubs and the social centers and the hospitals. It is wrong to say, as they do in remote places like Boham, Fontaine, and Grahamstown, and Beaufort West, that Johannesburg thinks only of money. We have as many good husbands and fathers, I think, as any town or city. And some of our big men make great collections of works of art, which means work for artists, and saves art from dying out. And some have great ranches in the north, where they shoot game and feel at one with nature. Now, when there is more work for other people, these people will start spending part of this 80 shillings. Not all of it, of course, for the men who sell at 100 shillings must keep some to buy back the shares when they 
haven't got quite so much kick in them, but the farmers will be able to produce more food and the manufacturers will be able to make more articles and the civil service will be able to offer more posts. Though why we should want more civil service is another question that we can hardly deal with here. And the natives need not starve in these reserves. The men can come to the mines and bigger and better compounds can be built for them and still more vitamins be put in their food. But we shall have to be careful about that because some fellow has discovered that labor can be over vitaminized. This is an example of the law of diminishing returns. And perhaps a great city will grow up, a second Johannesburg with a second Parktown and a second Houghton, a second Parkwood and a second Kensington, a second Jep and a second Redadorp and a second Primville and a second Shandytown, a great city that will be the pride of any Oden Dalrust. But isn't that name impossible? But there are some who say that it must not be so. All the welfare workers and this father Beresford and the other Kaffir Bodies say that it must not be so, though it must be admitted that most of them haven't one share certificate to rub against another. And they take heart too, for Sir Ernest Oppenheimer, one of the great men of the mine, has also said that it need not be so. For here is a chance, he says, to try out the experiment of settled mine labor in villages, not compounds, where a man can live with his wife and children. And there is talk, too, that the government will set up something like the Tennessee Valley Authority to control the development of the free state mining areas. They want to hear your voice again, Sir Ernest Oppenheimer. Some of them applaud you and some of them say thank God for you in their hearts, even at their bedsides. For mines are for men, not for money. And money is not something to go mad about and throw your hat into the air for. Money is for food and clothes and comfort and a visit to the pictures. Money is to make happy the lives of children. Money is for security and for dreams and for hopes and for purposes. Money is for buying the fruits of the earth, of the land where you were born. No second Johannesburg is needed upon the earth. One is enough.